This segment continues our discussion of fitting a nonlinear model to a set of data. The model has parameters, and we've found the value of those parameters in the previous segment. And we've also learned how to estimate the errors of those parameters, their covariance, in fact, in the previous segment. Now we want to talk about what if you have a derived quantity from the parameters? What's the uncertainty of some derived quantity? For example, the product of two of the parameters, or any nonlinear function. In this segment, I'm going to show you two different methods. The first one is called linearized propagation of errors. And this goes back, I don't know, 50 or 100 years. A little math note, I'm going to write the gradient of a function f in this way. So that's a vector. Its components are the partial derivatives of the function f with respect to each of its arguments. And the nerdy math note is that this is a row vector, not a column vector, because it's a one form, if you've ever heard that before. So where are we? We've got a maximum likelihood estimate of the parameters, and that's a vector b0. But we know that the true parameters are not exactly our maximum likelihood estimate. There is some error. So there's a random variable, b1, which is the small difference between the true values of the parameters and our maximum likelihood estimate. And b1 has a probability distribution. We've seen before that it is multivariate normal. Now what we're interested in is a function, an arbitrary function of the parameters b. And we can write that as a Taylor series expansion around its value at b0, the MLE estimate. And then the first term in the Taylor series is going to be linear in the difference of b minus b0. And the first derivative comes in. And the reason I emphasize that grad f was a row vector is that this then all works out as a dot product of a row vector times viewed as a matrix times a column vector viewed as a matrix. And so this is just a number. Now what's the expectation of f? Well, we take expectation on this expression up here, the expectation of f of b0, well f of b0 is just a number, so that expectation gives just f of b0 over here. And then the first term in the Taylor series would be grad f dotted into the expectation of b1. But as we already commented, b1 is distributed as a multivariate normal distribution with mean 0, and therefore the mean of this is 0, and that cancels out. So we find that to this order of accuracy, you can find the expectation of any function of the parameters by just taking the function of the MLE estimates. But what about the variance of this estimate? Well, the variance is, of course, the expectation of the function squared minus the expectation of the function squared. And so to do this, we're going to go back up to this line and take the square of it. We're trying to evaluate this term. Well, the square of this thing over here, the first term will be f of b0 quantity squared. Now, notice that we're just going to subtract that off again right here, because we learned that the expectation of f is just f of b0, so I won't even write that down. Then we're going to have the cross product between these two terms. So we're going to have 2 f of b0, and then grad f times expectation of b1. But we already decided that the expectation of b1 also vanishes. So although I wrote it down, this term also vanishes. And the term that really matters is going to be the one that comes from squaring this. So we want to evaluate the expectation of grad f dot b1 squared. Now although this is just a number, we can use matrix associativity to sort of unpack that number into a matrix expression. You can see that here. Here's one power of grad f times b1. And then here's another power. It's just the transpose, but the transpose of a scalar is just a scalar. So it's b1 transpose times grad f transpose. 
And the reason for doing this funny thing is so that I can move the expectation brackets in onto the random variables. And look what I get. I get the expectation of a matrix, because column vector times row vector is a matrix. And we've learned that this kind of an expectation on a vector of random variables is just exactly the covariance matrix of those variables. So what have we learned? We've learned that the variance on any function of the parameters is obtained by computing a gradient at the location B0, and here's its transpose, and sandwiching these two vectors in between the covariance matrix of the fitted parameters that we've seen in the last couple of segments. So let's make this more concrete by actually just doing it in our example with this test data. Remember we had these 20 data points and their error bars, and we fit them for a set of parameters, the maximum likelihood parameters, so that's this row here. And we're going to be interested in just B3 and B5. In fact, we're only going to be interested for this example in the product of B3 and B5, because as we commented before, that's going to be the area under this Gaussian hump here in the model. And we also have the covariance matrix that came out of the fit by taking the matrix inverse of half of the Hessian. So let's compute. We first compute the gradient vector. So we take the partial derivative of f, respectively, with respect to b1, b2, b3, b4, b5. b1, b2, and b4 just give 0 because they don't occur here. The partial derivative with respect to b3 is b5. The partial derivative with respect to b5 is b3. So now we form this quadratic form. Here's the sigma matrix. And you can see we only have non-vanishing things in the third and fifth position. So in the third position, that's going to generate from the diagonal term the b5 squared times the 3, 3 component of the matrix. Here up here is the 3, 3 component of the matrix. And then the matrix is symmetrical. So here I've just lumped together the two terms that we would get with a b3 and b5 times the matrix element sigma 3, 5, and the b3 squared times sigma 5, 5. So this expression basically is just writing out the matrix multiplication. Putting in the numbers from up here, we see that we get a value of 0 0.0336. That's the variance of f. So if we want the standard deviation of f, we take its square root. And what have we learned? We learned that our estimate of this derived quantity, b3, b5, is 0 0.98, which is the product of these two numbers, plus or minus 0 0.18, which we obtained here. And that's one standard deviation, also called the one sigma error bar. By the way, is the uncertainty in B3, B5, B3 times B5 normally distributed? Not on your life. A function of normally distributed random variables is, in general, not normal. Now, if the distribution of the individual pieces that go in is very narrow, then the function of the normals might look approximately normal might be close, and we'll see in this example it actually is reasonably close, but there's no reason that it should be exactly normal. Now I want to tell you a completely different way of doing the same calculation. This is a more modern, because more computational, way of doing it, and it also generalizes in some very important ways that we're going to see later in the course. This is called sampling from the posterior distribution. Well, we're interested in what is the distribution of fitted parameters b's. And we already know that it's centered on b0, and it's a multivariate normal with covariance matrix sigma sub b. So why don't we just generate a lot of b's, draw a lot of random deviates, b's, from this distribution. 
and then from each one we'll compute the function of interest f of b and then let's just draw a histogram of the functions that come out in other words if this is the posterior distribution of b's then we can compute the posterior distribution of any functions f of b just by sampling now this particular histogram comes from not the data set we've been playing with but with a more complicated data set that we'll see later in the course and I brought it forward here to show you that this procedure can give very non-normal distributions for what the posterior distribution of f of b is and that's what the distribution really does look like in this example which we'll see later in the course notice that b itself typically is multivariate normal or very close to multivariate normal because of the central limit theorem. So it's the nonlinear function that messes up the central limit theorem here and that can give a result here which is quite different from normal. So let's do this in our simpler example. Remember the data. I'm going to do this in MATLAB which has a convenient function multivariate normal random and the way you use this function is you tell it how many samples you want I'm going to do 10,000 and you give it a vector which is the mean of the multivariate normal distribution and you give it a covariance matrix and it generates in this case a big matrix of B's each row is a separate vector of five B values then I'm going to compute my quantity of interest. This is the f function, and that is just b3 times b5 computed for all of the uh, rows. And then I'm going to histogram that into 30 bins, and let's compute its standard deviation. So here's the result. First notice that the standard deviation, 0 0.1833, is almost exactly what we got previously by propagating errors linearly in the analytic framework. You can also notice that the posterior distribution of B3, B5 kind of looks normal. It's actually not normal and you can see that it's actually somewhat skew. The right tail is extends out a bit farther than the left tail and that's what you expect when you take the product of two normally distributed values. Here's a test to see if you understand what we've been talking about on covariance matrices. You can see up here I used the full covariance matrix. That is to say this was a 5 by 5 matrix. But I'm only interested in quantities that depend on B3 and B5. So do you think I could have used just the 2 by 2 piece of the covariance matrix for the parameters 3 and 5? I won't tell you the answer to that. I'll let you think about that one. So let's compare the two methods of finding the posterior distribution of a derived quantity that we've done in this segment. Notice that when you have lots of data so that the B's really become in the limit, the parameters really become in the limit, multivariate, normal, distributed, then as I've now said several times, the derived quantity might be very non-normally distributed. In this case, sampling the posterior is really giving you more information than linear propagation of errors. Linear propagation of errors only gave you a mean and variance of the posterior. Here with sampling, we get the whole distribution. For example, if our derived quantity was a quotient, was the ratio of two normals of zero mean, that turns out to be a Cauchy distribution, which is very non-normal. So sampling of the posterior is a more powerful method than linear propagation of errors. And that's true whether or not we're in the limit where the central limit theorem applies and so the distribution of the individual parameters is really multivariate Gaussian. In fact, the reason that I've gone through this in such detail is because this idea, sampling the posterior distribution for a set of interesting 
values derived from fitted parameters. This is a kind of a baby version of something that has a different name. It's called Markov Chain Monte Carlo in a more powerful version. And this is perhaps the most powerful technique in all modern computational statistics. So we've taken a first step in that direction, and you can be sure we'll come back to this in later segments of the course.